Open the word with you this morning and um, looking forward to uh, working through a passage that I think I include some stories that are probably familiar to some of you. We're going to look at Mark chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Uh, it's actually uh, a story where we see a very honest interaction between Jesus and some people that he encounters. One is a synagogue official and the other is a woman who is in a desperate, desperate situation. So in Mark chapter 5, uh, we see this encounter with Jesus. And one of the things that I always find fascinating about the Gospels is um, when I was coming up in, in school, uh, we studied uh, all of Paul's theology and we studied all of the epistles and wrestled through that. And of course, the Old Testament and the origin of things and the law and the Gospels were always treated as sort of Jesus's life, sort of a place that we go to see a little bit about Jesus. But the truth is that the Gospels are incredibly instructive. Every time that Jesus interacts with uh, an individual or a group of individuals, there's something powerful to learn. And I think in this passage in Mark, uh, we'll see the same thing. So let me read uh, just a little bit uh, of, from Mark chapter 5. Actually, the passage I want to cover is somewhat lengthy, but it's right in the middle, beginning at verse 21. And then I will... Uh, Pray and then we'll unpack this. This is Jesus um, crossing again uh, to the other side of the sea after the calming of the storm. So that, that passage, actually, I think that's what I spoke on last time here. So chapter 5, beginning at verse 21. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years, who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, but was no better off, in fact, grew rather worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who has touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house someone who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. They laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him, and went in where the child was, taking her by the hand. And he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we indeed thank you for your goodness and for your grace. We thank you for your loving kindness, for your mercies, which are new every morning. We thank you for the way that you meet our needs according to your good and perfect will, for the grace that you show us, for the provision uh, that you uh, make happen in our lives. We thank you, Father, for all the good things that we enjoy by your gracious hand. We thank you especially for those gifts that are ours in and through Jesus Christ, namely redemption and forgiveness of sin and the promise of eternal life. We thank you for these things. We thank you for your word, for the power that it has to divide between joint and marrow. We thank you that it is living and active, that it is breathed out for you, from you for our instruction, for our encouragement, and indeed for our reproof and benefit. 
Father, we thank you for the body of Christ, which gathers to worship all over the world on this Lord's Day. We pray that your church may be upheld by your good hand, that it may continue to carry out its work of proclaiming the good news of Jesus and discipling men and women in their faith. We thank you for this congregation, for your good hand of provision that's been upon it, not just for its history, but for what is happening here now and for what you will do in and through this flock in the years to come. We pray for them and their needs. Uh, For a shepherd, we pray that you would bring the right man here according to your will to bless and to encourage them, to lead them, to teach them well. We pray even now, Lord, though uh, we we do not know how the situation would be resolved, that you would give them faith and grace to trust you for your provision of their leader. We pray for those in our midst who are struggling. We pray for those who are physically under the weather that your grace would be made known to them, that they would bear up under their infirmities in a way that would bring you glory and testify to your sustaining power. We pray that as their days, so may their strength be. For those who are feeling overwhelmed by life, who are struggling in their minds and hearts, we pray that you would grant them calmness of heart and clarity of mind that comes from you. Remind them of the truths of your word and the promises contained therein. Father, for those who are struggling to Submit themselves to your will. We pray that your spirit would be at work in them. For those that are walking with you and experiencing great joy, we pray that you would encourage them and keep them in your care. Father, we pray that you would uh, strengthen this body, make them a blessing and encouragement to one another. We pray now as we look into your word that you would grant us, again, open minds and hearts to receive instruction from this passage of Scripture, we pray that your Spirit would be at work to use your Word to accomplish your will in our lives. Father, we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. We know that you use your Word to strengthen our faith, and we pray this day as we look into this interaction between Jesus and those gathered around him that our faith might be strengthened, that the way in which we see the things going on around us, for the way in which we experience life, for the decisions we make, about our walk with you, we pray that this passage of Scripture would have impact upon us. And we pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. This is a uh, pretty familiar Bible story. Jesus has crossed over the sea. The storm comes up. He calms the sea. He continues on his way. Uh, He heals a man with a demon in rather dramatic fashion. Remember, right before this is a case where Jesus not only casts out a demon from a man who's significantly and substantially vexed by this demon. This is the chain-breaking man, sort of the one who can't be bound. And the demons come out of him and go into the pigs. Remember the pigs that jump over the cliff to their own peril. This is right after that. And the reason I point that out is because the power of Jesus has been made known throughout the land. This is not in the beginning where they say, oh, this is that guy that that made water into wine. This is actually that guy that cast demons into a, a herd of pigs. This is that guy who has healed withered hands and lame men. This is that guy who has fed multitudes. Jesus' power and his miraculous sort of intervention in the lives of people is known throughout the land. And we're going to see that played out in this passage because this isn't like Jesus is sort of moving through the countryside in obscurity. He's actually crossed over to the other side. And the Bible says here, this is, this is Mark's gospel, and just a little bit about that, um, Mark wasn't here to record this. This is most likely Peter telling Mark what happened when he was walking with Jesus. And that adds a whole new dimension to the story because you have to sort of pick this up. You sort of picture a dimly lit room, maybe a prison or under house arrest, where, where young John Mark, that, that, that young boy in the Gospels who was fleeing Jesus' scene of Jesus' arrest, this is him. He's writing down, and the aged apostle Peter is saying, and then, and then we were on the sea, and a storm came up, and Jesus calmed the sea. And then, and then this demoniac came out and Jesus cast the demons out and then we crossed over and this crowd gathered this is 
Peter telling John Mark at the end of his life these things that happened. And so Mark records for us, when Jesus crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. And the issue here is very clear. Jesus steps off the boat, and people are drawn to him. There is a huge crowd that gathers, and this crowd will persist. In fact, what Jesus is doing constantly is he, he deals with the crowds as they come, and then he withdraws from the crowd. The relationship between Jesus and the crowd is always interesting. And I feel the need to point it out because we live in a day and age that actually believes that we measure the impact of faith by the size of the crowd gathered around Jesus. And that's not the way to measure the impact of ministry. It's to measure those that are closest to them, how much they will stay with him no matter what. There were lots of crowds that gathered around Jesus, and sometimes those crowds didn't make it. Remember at the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus feeds them, and then everybody's happy, and he says, well, of course you're happy. I gave you food. You, you, we, we, turned, we turned this little bit of food into a food that fed thousands of people. Of course you're happy. You got a free meal. But I tell you this, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have nothing to do with me. And the disciples noted that everybody left. They all went away. And the disciples go to Jesus and say, hey, stop talking like this because everybody's leaving. Stop saying they have to eat your flesh and drink your blood. That's a hard saying. It's much better if we do more miracles. More people will come if we do more miracles. And then we have another case where Jesus is healing people, and there are, so, there, there are so many people coming to be healed that they're digging holes in ceilings to lower people down. And later that day, later that night, after all of those healings and the word had gotten out and this crowd is gathering around this little humble house, Jesus disappears and the disciples find him off in the darkness. And they say, Jesus, what are we doing? What are you doing? We've got this huge crowd. Jesus says, no, no, let's go over to that other town over there that I may teach there also because that's what I came to do. Whenever we see Jesus interacting with the crowd, there's something to be learned from the fact that he doesn't dismiss the crowds, but the crowd is not where the impact is measured. Because Jesus doesn't look at the crowds and say, that's the thing, is to get a crowd. Jesus looks at the crowd and sees every individual and their needs. And that's going to show up in this particular passage. This great crowd gathers around Jesus by the sea. And then one of the rulers of the synagogue an official, one of the people that is part of the gang that's making it hard for Jesus, comes to him and falls at his feet and says, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come lay your hands on her so she may be well and live. And you got to get a picture of this. Probably what's happening is Jesus is getting off the boat and the crowd gathers around and they're not getting in a line. They're not getting in rows. They're not sitting in pews. It's sort of a mass of people gathered around Jesus. Some people are actually pushing in to get closer. Some people are actually staying out on the fringe saying, yeah, I don't know about this guy, but I'll listen from a distance. But whatever is happening, there's all of this going on. And one thing you can bet is the disciples are not sitting back. The disciples are trying to stay in. They're trying to create a wall of protection around Jesus. They're they're in close to him. They want to hear everything he says. They want to be right with him. And so what happens is the disciples and Jesus are at the core, the nucleus of this crowd that's gathering, this very diverse crowd with various levels of curiosity and appreciation for who Jesus is. And there's a lot of energy, a lot of, a lot of dynamism. There's a lot of chaos, I'm sure. And this synagogue ruler comes up to Jesus, and I'm sure the disciples are looking, saying, Jesus, why are we talking to this guy? This guy's one of the troublemakers. He's a ruler of the synagogue. He's, he's in cahoots with those Pharisees and Sadducees and other Jewish leaders who are not just making it difficult for us. They're out to get us. They're out to get you. Why would we pay any attention to this man? In all of the crowd that's here, why Jairus? He gets through and he sees Jesus and he falls at his feet and implores him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come lay your hands on her so that she may be made well. And he went with him. It's very easy to say, well, you know, it's kind of matter of factly. Guy comes up, says, hey, Jesus, will you do this? Yeah, sure, I'll do that. I'll go with you. It's probably more going on than that. The disciples are probably saying, here we go again. Jesus is going to leave this crowd to go with this Jewish official. Doesn't he know? No one likes the Jewish officials. Doesn't he know? Like, we've got a big crowd here. We've got some great miracles to, to bounce off of here. We've got a little, we've got a little momentum. Jesus, Jesus doesn't understand how you market this thing, right? You've got a crowd. You don't quit. You just keep pouring it on. But Jesus sees this man, this Jewish leader, this synagogue ruler, who in desperation comes to Jesus because his little girl is sick, sick to the point of death. But what does he do? He doesn't say to him, Jesus, I'm a ruler of the synagogue. I'm a man of pretty significant position. You probably know who I am. 
my daughter's not feeling well. I'd like it if you could come help me out. That's not what he does. Peter tells Mark, this Jewish leader, he did what you don't see Jewish leaders do in the synagogue. He fell at the feet of Jesus and said, my daughter is about to die. She has no hope unless you come. And Jesus goes. Jesus goes. Why does he go? Because there's a need, and he can meet it, and he wants to meet it in this way. But the Bible goes on to record for us that the great crowd followed him and thronged about him. It's a very interesting choice of word. It's not just Jesus started walking away and then everybody's kind of running after him and sort of, hey guys, guys, he's going over here. He's turning right. It's actually this mass. If you, if you were looking at the scene today, we'd get somebody's drone and we'd see this sort of mass, this human blob sort of moving through the countryside around Jesus. Think about a cluster of bees or a, a, a pile of ants on something. It's, that's what it is. It's a throng. It's all over Jesus. It's all over him. And he's trying to go to be with this man to save his daughter's life, to heal her, because that man came to him in faith and threw himself at Jesus' feet and said, if you'll lay hands on her, I know she'll live. I know she'll be well again. And so he goes and the great crowd comes. And in the middle of all of that, this great thronging crowd, this mass of people, Mark tells us there's a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. She suffered much under many physicians, spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. It's a very vivid picture. The crowd is sort of thronging around Jesus, and he's about, he's done several miracles. He's about to do another one. He's going to go heal this little girl, and so he's heading off, and he's going through this huge crowd, and here, so the disciples must be thinking, I would be thinking, here we go again. Jesus is deviating from the plan. We got the big momentum, and he's going to go leave, and then they're going to leave, and the crowd's going with him, and some woman makes her way through the crowd to Jesus, and he stops. Now, this woman is recorded for us very interesting, and something interesting happens. At the end of this passage, which I read earlier, where the woman is healed, she goes probably to tell people what had happened. And, and there's no record in Mark's gospel that they interviewed her on the scene that, you know, who are you and what do you do and what happens? No, so what happens is we can assume from the detail that they have here that there was later conversation. Maybe this woman became a follower of Jesus and, and went with him. But they know a lot about her. First of all, she's a woman who has a serious problem, a discharge of blood for 12 years, which means she is likely anemic and weak. In this time frame, right, this is sort of not good to be anemic. It's not good to be bleeding. There's no, there's no blood transfusions. There's no plasma banks. There's nothing like that. She is losing strength daily for 12 years. She is constantly bleeding. She is, she is anemic. She is weak. Not only that, under Jewish custom and Jewish law and Jewish tradition, she's unclean. She's ceremonially unclean. It isn't just that she's unclean and can't have relations with her husband or, or any of that. She, no one can touch her. She's not permitted in the temple. She is out no fault of her own. She has a disease from which she is bleeding perpetually for 12 years. She is weak and she is an outcast. She is not to be touched. You cannot touch her. You cannot hug her. You cannot comfort her. You cannot embrace her in worship. She is weak and she is very ill and socially isolated. Not only that, John Mark tells us that she'd been to the doctor and spent everything she had and didn't get better but only got worse. Some things never change. The, 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 the idea is, right, that, that, that she spends, she's, she's, not just, she's not just sick, she's not just weak, she's not just isolated, she's also poor. Her ailment has led her to the point where she is going to seek medical treatment, and, and medicine at this particular time is not that great. Other places we see recorded things where she was probably given grain that had already been digested from animals to actually uh, uh, attempt to change her, her, her organ function. This was something that they did in antiquity. You and I on this side of antiquity know that's not a good idea. That's how infection spreads. So now she's actually getting worse. She isn't, it isn't that it didn't work and she has to bear up under this. It's getting worse. This is a woman whose condition we have very little to compare to. She is, she is beyond human touch. She is beyond physical 
uh, uh, strength. She is financially destitute. She is desperate in a way that is difficult to imagine. She is at the bottom of this crowd, figuratively and literally. The only way for someone in that condition to get that close to Jesus, and we see it because we see that she touched the hem of his garment, which is the bottom of his garment, is she's on her hands and knees. This weak, social outcast, destitute woman is crawling through the crowd to get to Jesus because she knows one thing. If I could just, I don't need an audience. I don't need him to come with me. I don't need him to look me in the eye. All I need to do is get close enough to touch his clothing and I know that I'll be made well. That's the level of her faith. I only have to get close enough to touch the hem of her garment, his garment. And she's crawling through the crowd on her hands and knees. Now, she's not crawling through the crowd on her hands and knees on a hardwood floor that's been mopped. This is antiquity. This is Jesus moving through the countryside. If they're on a road, that's worse because the only means of conveyance were animals, and they're not the most sanitary creatures when they're moving. This is a dusty, dirty, manure-covered road. She's on her hands and knees to get to Jesus. She's that desperate. Look, at this point, it's important to see that, that when we're looking into the Bible and we see these encounters with Jesus, we see the kind of real despair that people have, but there's something else that, that, that the right capture for us. Whether you're talking about Jairus at the beginning of the passage or this woman now, whatever they are experiencing, all they want is Jesus. You and I experience far less grave situations than this every day. And how tempting it is to look for solutions and to go to places other than to Jesus. But this woman is at the bottom of it. She's at the bottom of the crowd, figuratively and literally. She is in the most desperate situation we can imagine. She fights her way on her hands through the crowd and touches Jesus' garment. And immediately, blood flow is dried. She feels better. All she had to do was to get close enough to touch the hem of his garment, and she does, and she's healed, and she knows she's healed. She feels it because she's had 12 years of misery, and it's gone like that. And then what happens is almost comical. Jesus, and this is something to get your mind around. Jesus doesn't say, somebody grabbed me, somebody tripped me, somebody pulled, you know that, you pull on the coattails of your, your, your parents when you're a little kid, you pull on it, go away, you pull. That's not what happened here. Someone tugging. Mark's very specific. Jesus says, I felt power leave me. I felt power leave me. This is how attuned Jesus is to to the needs of those around him. She doesn't have to pull on his garment to get his attention, to get his eye contact, to say, hey, listen, I'm down here and I need you. All she has to do is just touch his garment. And Jesus' sensitivity to the needs of those around him is so great that he feels power leave him. And that's really great. The funny part comes next. He turns around and says to the disciples, who touched me? Now, just picture you if you wanted to just put yourself in the disciples' shoes for a minute. There's hundreds, if not thousands, and tens of thousands of people gathered around Jesus at this time. There's this complete little buzz in the middle. Everybody's sort of milling around. They're trying to get out clear to get to Jairus' house. And this woman crawls through the crowd and touches the hem of Jesus' garment. They can't see her because she's on her hands and knees. And Jesus says, who touched me? And they're thinking, are you crazy? They even say, what do you, how can you ask us that? Do you see this crowd? How could you ask us who touched me? Who touched me? Jesus, how are we supposed to touch me? Everybody's touching you. Yeah, but this one touched my garment in faith and I felt power leave me. Who touched me? Who touched you? And then you can almost see it. This is what we lose. We think, well, then, then, then Jesus is like, who touched me? And they go, I don't know who touched you. No, 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 no. These guys are grabbing people. Did you touch him? 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 Did you touch Jesus? Did you touch? Everybody's going, of course I touched him. Somebody pushed me into him. There, there's this great, at the middle of this is all of this emotion and chaos. And this woman is terrified that the disciples are actually going to pummel whoever it was that touched Jesus. And she cries out, it was me. I touched him. Here's why. And he turns to her in a moment of un fathomable compassion. She falls down before him and tells him the whole truth. And he says to her, daughter, this 
Sick, sickly, weak, outcast, destitute woman, the Son of God turns to her and says, daughter. Imagine just for a minute how powerful those words must have been. No one spoke to her intimately. Everyone was afraid of being soiled by her condition. No one touched the unclean. No one wanted to risk that. No one talked to her that way. Physicians took her money and and gave her treatments that only made her worse. No one showed this kind of love. This man, whom she sought to touch his garment and crawled through the crowd on her hands and knees, turns to her and with great affection and intimacy calls her daughter and then says, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. In the midst of all the chaos going on, Jesus does not fail to show her compassion. One point that I think is important for us to remember when we think about Jesus and think about it even in terms of our own lives, even when Jesus does things that seem to us, and he does a lot of them, incomprehensible, completely counterintuitive, way outside the box, completely counter to the way that we would think about it, he is always compassionate. He is always loving. He cannot be otherwise. Even when he's driving the money changers from the steps of the temple, it's love that motivates him. It isn't hate. It's love. He loves his father and the house of God too much. And he loves those people too much to let them continue in error. When he turns to Peter and says, get thee behind me, Satan, it's an act of love and kindness to Peter. I'm not going to let you get this one wrong, son. When he turns to this woman, this this is the same kind of Jesus compassion that we see throughout the Gospels. But he refers to her as daughter, which the word itself would have been soothing to her to to not just her ailment, but her situation. And he says, your faith, he knows that she came in faith, has made you well. Go, go in peace, be healed of your disease. Now, that'd be a great story if it ended there. But remember, that's not where we started. Jairus says, come heal my daughter. She's about to die. So now Jesus has has stopped. and, And we're thinking about the disciples and we're thinking about this woman. Think about Jairus at this minute. Wait, Jesus, you said you were coming with me. You said you were coming with me to heal my daughter. And we got distracted by what? By a destitute, sickly woman who was crawling on her hands and knees and touched her garment. Can't we keep moving? If we don't get moving, my daughter will die. He's a Jewish synagogue official. He knows how out of protocol it is for Jesus to do anything with this woman. And he's got to be standing there thinking we're wasting precious time on someone who is not worth it while my daughter is dying. And at that moment, a servant comes onto the scene and says, your little girl is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. And in this is another act of grace. This man is struggling and probably struggling with the reality that his daughter is sick. Jesus is distracted by this other woman and a servant comes up now and says, your daughter's dead. As powerfully healing as the word daughter was to, Jesus, to the woman that Jesus healed, this servant saying your daughter is dead is the complete antithesis of that for Jairus. His whole world has just ended. It's just ended. He went to Jesus, threw himself at Jesus' feet, saying, come heal my daughter, you're her only shot. And now he's just heard the words that she is dead. That she is dead. And that's how it is in life. You get overwhelmed by something. You think, there's no hope. It's all over. Jesus overheard what was said and turned to Jairus and said, do not fear, only believe. Now, I just this is the, the climactic message of the entire passage. Jesus turns to Jairus and says, I know they told you she's dead. You came to me in faith. Do not be afraid, only believe. Only believe. We sometimes miss this. All the exhortations in the scripture about not being afraid or being bold and courageous. Whether we're talking about Joshua and the exhortation to be strong and courageous or we're talking about David standing up to Goliath and we're talking about the the New Testament situations where Jesus says, don't be afraid. And even here when he says to Jairus, don't be afraid. It's easy for us to think, well, what you have to do is pull yourself up by your bootstraps, dig down in deep, find that courage and press on. After all, David stood up to Goliath. 
David stood up to Goliath because said, he said, you come against me in your armor and your sword. I come up against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty. It wasn't David's prowess or strength. He didn't, isn't brave in the, in the human earthly sense of it. He's brave and doesn't fear because he believes God. And Jesus does something interesting for this man. Don't be afraid, only believe. And in this passage, then, we see this illustrated over and over again. It isn't that we're afraid and we say, make my fear go away. Jesus says, don't be afraid, rather believe. I am the Son of God. <clears throat> You've been following these miracles and listening to me teach. And he says to him, don't fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to go with them. And they set out for Jairus' house. Only Peter and James and John, the brother of James, went along. And this is interesting because this story is being told by Mark, who's being told this by Peter, probably. So Peter's one of the ones that goes with Jesus. They pull away from the crowd. They're going to Jairus' house now. And you think, you say, well, where's the crowd? Well, the crowd's got nothing to see. There's not going to be any healing. The girl's dead. They're done. Jesus is still going to this house for a funeral. Funerals, that, we're not going for a funeral. We'd go to see her healed. We'd go to see thousands fed. We'd go to see this. We'd go to see that. We're not going to, to a funeral. So the, the crowd peels off. Jesus goes on just with those men, that handful of men, and Peter is one of them. And they set out again to go to Jairus' house. And they came to his house, and what do they see? From a distance, they see a commotion, wailing, weeping. <clears throat> and this is probably familiar to a lot of you. It was not a gathering of family and friends. There's every chance, according to historical record, that these are paid mourners. This was the Jewish tradition. When someone died, you had a period of grief and mourning and weeping. And if you didn't have people with you to do that, you could actually pay people to come weep and mourn with you. And they put on quite a show. The historical record shows you, you pay me, and you pay me well, I'll cry loud and long as you want, right? If there's overtime, I'm in. Like whatever, it if, if all I have to do is cry to get paid, I'm in. So this crowd is gathered around, probably paid mourners and weepers who are now making a commotion because the little girl has died. Now they're not moved by their grief necessarily for the little girl. They're, they could be, some of them could be. But the point in this tradition is that you wail loudly. You weep loudly. You, you make a big show of it. You, you, are, you are crying out. You're trying to get all of the pain that is in you out. And this group of mourners has gathered around. And how do we know that there's a problem with the character of this crowd? Because when Jesus says, she's not dead, she's only sleeping, they laugh at him. Right? It's a pretty slick shift in emotion. Isn't it? You're weeping for the little girl, and then you're laughing at a man who says, she is not dead. But they're there, and Jesus comes on the scene, and you have all these people weeping and wailing. And Jesus entered and said to them, why are you making commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, and he put them out. And this is, again, really powerful. Even in this, Jesus puts out, Jesus isn't mad because they laughed at him. Jesus puts them out because they're in the way of God doing his work. He comes on the scene, and they're weeping. He comes, and he says, don't, don't, don't do this. What, what are you doing? When he asked the question, why are you making commotion and weeping and wailing, he actually isn't looking for an answer, right? He, he knows why they're there. He says, what are you doing? What are you doing? It's basically what he's saying. Jesus said, what are you doing? We don't need this. She's not dead. She's only asleep. What that crowd that was wailing doesn't understand at the moment, what the disciples didn't understand in the moment, is that Jesus wasn't saying the doctors were wrong. She isn't dead. She's in a coma or she fainted. Jesus isn't saying, pronouncing a medical diagnosis. He's actually speaking as one who is the resurrection and the life. She is not dead, she only sleeps. Because Jesus is the one who has victory over. There is no such thing as death, permanent death in Jesus. Only life, only life. I've come that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the resurrection and the life. They that believed in me, though they were dead, yet shall they live. In that way, there is nothing to fear when we have faith in Jesus Christ. When Jesus turns and says, the little girl isn't dead. She's only asleep. He isn't diagnosing her medical condition. He's making a statement. She lives because I am here. And then Jesus goes on to actually give her physical life. 
physical life. He takes her by the hand and he says to her, Talithi, Talitha Kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately, Mark records, you can almost hear Peter saying, and then, and then Jesus said, Talitha Kumi, and she stood up. It wasn't like, you know, it, 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 it wasn't like a soap opera, <laughs> you know, oh, blink, blink. It wasn't, it wasn't this sort of dragging out kind of thing, you know, and she's in a weak voice. Peter says, no, 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 no. No, she was dead, and when he said, little girl, arise, she was up like that. Immediately, she was up and walking, up and walking. She was up and walking. And then, in parentheses, for she was about 12 years of age, so the issue is, Peter's saying, and she, we're not, she wasn't a little baby, and she wasn't an old woman. She's a 12-year-old. She was dead. This little girl was dead. And when Jesus said, little girl, arise, she is immediately up and walking around. She's up and walking. And John's writing it down feverly. John Mark's writing it down feverly. And they all, he's, Peter says, they're all overcome with amazement. We could not believe our eyes. We had seen him calm the sea. We had seen him cast out demons. We had seen him heal the lame. We had seen him feed the multitudes. This little girl was dead. They were weepers and mourners who descended on the place like flies on a pile. And they're all sort of weeping. And Jesus put them out. And then he said to her, arise. And she got up immediately. And that would be great. If the story ended there, say, wow, look what Jesus, Jesus had quite an afternoon. He healed a woman who touched his garment, you know, complete stranger, and then goes to this house and casts out these professional mourners and then says, little girl, get up, and she gets up, and that'd be great. But I've been struck by the end of this passage over and over and over again. Because none of us who believe in Jesus and have read the Bible question the miracles. Maybe Thomas Jefferson did and took them all out, but we don't. We know that Jesus, who is the Son of God and rose from the dead, we know he turned water into wine. We know he took a few loaves and fishes and fed thousands of people. We know he healed the lame. We know he healed the blind. We know he healed the man with a withered hand. We know he drove out demons. We know that he brought Lazarus back to life. We know that he did this with this little girl. We know the power of Jesus. And we also know that the number of record, the number of people in the record, the gospel record, who experienced this kind of miraculous intervention from Jesus is relatively small compared to the number of people Jesus came into contact with. He didn't heal everyone he came into contact with. He didn't cast out every demon and every demoniac. He didn't feed every crowd. The point being that God can do whatever he wants and does it according to his will and timing but he is always loving. In this we see the love and compassion and grace of Jesus manifest. It's a great record for us to draw from. But the end of this passage is fascinating to me. The little girl got up and began walking for she was 12 years of age and everyone was amazed. And I wonder why he didn't stop there, but Peter felt the need to report that then Jesus strictly charged them that no one was to know about this and told them to give her something to eat. I was in a conversation one time with an unbeliever who said, of course you believe Jesus did miracles. And maybe he did do things that, I mean, there's lots of record of people doing miraculous kinds of things, but it's all self-serving. You do it to get attention. You do it to gain a crowd. You do it because it advances your purposes and your, and your, and your objectives. And my argument was actually Jesus only ever does things out of love and compassion and to glorify his father. And I actually used this passage as an example because if Jesus was only concerned about the mileage he would get from bringing a little girl back to life, what does he care if she's going to eat or not? Of course her parents are going to take care of her. Jesus is just like, just like in that crowd. He sees the crowd and he knows what every individual in the crowd needs and who believes and who doesn't and who's coming to him for what. He knows that. He, he raises this little girl from the dead who's been sick and says, give her something to eat for she's weak. That's, that's attention to a very small detail in one regard, but it's huge in terms of its existence in the record. Jesus isn't interested just in her being alive. He's interested in her well-being. He's interested not just in, 
in bringing her back to life. He's interested in her life. Give her some food that she may eat because she is weak. It's an incredibly powerful idea. But just before it is something interesting where he says, don't tell anybody about this. And I've wrestled for a long time. Why would he do that? Why wouldn't Jesus say, go tell all your friends what I did? Go tell all your friends. In fact, there are times in the Gospels where Jesus heals someone and says, now go and tell everyone what I've done for you. Go and tell everyone what I've done for you. He says to others, go and tell your family what I've done for you. He says to others, I wouldn't tell anybody if I were you. And he says to these parents, don't tell a soul what I've done. And I've wrestled and wrestled and wrestled. Why does Jesus in certain cases say tell and in other cases tell, say not to tell? And I actually think what happens is unfolding here is gr- even, an even more powerful demonstration of the grace and mercy of Jesus. There's a story in the Gospels where Jesus heals a man. And the man goes and reports his testimony and says, this man, Jesus, healed me. And remember, he gets, he gets carted back and forth between the Pharisees and this group and that group and all of this. And he's a spectacle. They're dragging him around saying, he wasn't healed, he's lying. Is this the man you healed? Yes, that's the man. Is this the man that healed you? Yes, this is the man. That man's life was turned into a spectacle. It became a pawn in the hands of the Jewish leaders. And, it, and, and his life, he, he gets healed, but his life is turned inside out because now he's part of this game between Jesus and, and the Jewish officials and the political nature of it. People were questioning him. It wasn't that everybody praised God that he was healed. Some people actually said, we have to kill him because he'll take testify to Jesus and we can't have Jesus getting any more traction. When Jesus says to these parents, don't tell anyone, he says, because I will not have that for this little girl. I will not have her life be ruined by the gift of being brought back to life. Jesus' compassion on this particular family, a man of the synagogue, is not just to bring his daughter back to life, but to care that she be strengthened and cared for and not become a or a political pawn or, or something to be exploited. Rather, just let her live. Brothers and sisters, when we read passages like this, it's easy to see a historical record of Jesus' life and a miracle. Isn't it great how powerful he is? But in this particular act, with the thronging crowds around him, mercy shown to this woman going through the dirt, and the mercy shown to healing this man's dead daughter, and then caring for her physical needs, we see that the Jesus, these individuals, were fighting everything around them to get to, is worth getting to. Believing in him and throwing ourselves at his feet to be recipients of his goodness, his grace, his mercy is a fight worth taking on. No matter what crowds in your life, no matter what storms, no matter what trials, this is it. Always be pushing through to get to Jesus. Believe, do not be afraid. Understand who it is, how much love and grace and mercy and compassion is in who Jesus is. It's all for us, his people. We won't always be relieved of our circumstances as these individuals are, but it's the same Jesus we seek that did this work on this day in that part of the world. I got to figure that uh, at the end of his life when Peter is recalling these stories for John Mark, that he's somewhat animated about it, reliving every moment. And the detail that is included in this particular passage is really phenomenal. I think Peter was completely taken with this, completely taken with the crowd, with the Jewish leader coming, with the woman crawling through, with Jesus raising this little girl after sending out the mourners and then caring for her most basic needs, her food and her privacy. It's a great picture of Jesus. It's a great interaction between Jesus and others that's worth thinking about and receiving instruction from. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for this passage of scripture and for the story that is recorded for us of this healing and this resurrection. We pray uh, for the grace to accept it, to accept the power of Jesus demonstrated here, to be encouraged by the demonstration of faith portrayed here, and to be inspired in our own lives to be followers of Jesus who simply want to believe him no matter what, 
who when faced with things that terrify us or discourage us or break us, that we would fight through all of that to be near the one who loves and cares for us, our good shepherd who brings life and life abundantly. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We're going to close with this song, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. And, you know, as um, Dr. Williams said, Jesus sees us. He knows what we need, and he meets our needs.